Hello friends, my name is Reverend Mark Coles and I'm based in the Sankey Valley Methodist Circuit. Uh, today I'd like to share with you from Matthew's Gospel, uh, chapter 10 and verses 24 uh, to 39. The student is not above the teacher, nor a servant above his master. It is enough for students to be like their teachers and servants to be like their masters. If the head of the household has been called Beelzebul, how much more the members of his household. So do not be afraid of them, for there is nothing concealed that will not be disclosed, or hidden that will not be made known. What I tell you in the dark, speak in the daylight. What is whispered in your ear, proclaim from the rooftops. Don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Yet not one of them falls to the ground outside your father's care. And even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. So don't be afraid. You are worth more than sparrows. Whoever acknowledges me before others, I will also acknowledge them before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before others, I will disown them before my Father in heaven. Do not suppose uh, that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. For I have come to turn a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his own household. Anyone who loves their father or mother uh, more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves uh, their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. We thank God for his word to us on this day. Amen. Now a woman was watching the news uh, one night. And it was reported that a car was going in the wrong direction on the motorway. The woman knew her husband was on that motorway and became concerned, so she called her uh, husband's mobile phone. And hands-free, of course, he answered. And she said, dear, uh, there's one car going in the wrong direction on the motorway. Her husband exclaimed, one car? There's hundreds of them. My friends, the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 20 and verse 7 says these words but if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name his word in my heart is like fire a fire shut up in my bones and I am weary of holding it in indeed I cannot his word is in my heart like fire a fire shut up in my bones I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I cannot. Now, Jeremiah lived uh, around 650 to 570 BC, and he had a message that people don't want to hear. It is about them going in the wrong direction. For the people of God are not listening to God's voice. And the consequence will therefore be that God will soon do something dramatic about it. Now in chapter 20, uh, Jeremiah is ridiculed and mocked because of his words. And the people want to denounce him. And so they're waiting for him uh, to make one little mistake, one little slip, so that they can take their revenge on him. Sadly, this includes not just words, but physical attacks, such as being thrown into a dry water tank. But Jeremiah is driven to speak, forth telling God's word. For he says that God's word is like a fire going from his heart to his very bones, and he cannot, he cannot hold it in. 
Truth be told, my friends, down through the centuries, there are other prophets who have suffered similar fates to Jeremiah. For people, even God's people, are not always ready to welcome God's word spoken to them. For even when Jesus spoke out on certain issues, uh, there were those who were not, who were not willing to listen. Now in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10, Jesus is preparing the disciples to be sent out. However, it feels as if this is a place where Matthew has brought together a number of sayings, and some of them are quite difficult, and some are indeed challenging. So let's start with the sparrows. Now there are, I am told, 50 different species of sparrow, and that there are sparrows in every part of the world. They've built nests on the top of the Empire State Building in New York. They've even built nests down in coal mine in Yorkshire. And no one seems to know how many there are in total. We can only make a guess that there are in fact billions and billions of sparrows. Now Jesus says that there are so many that you can buy two of them for a penny. But that actually God knows how many there are and that he cares, he cares for them and knows them and is concerned even when one falls from the air. Friends, for many of us, we believe that God created the world. Now for me, it doesn't matter whether we believe that he did it in six days or in uh, billions of years. What matters is that God is the creator and that the world belongs to him. And that he didn't start it all off and then walk away to do something else. You see, I believe that Jesus shows us here in Matthew's Gospel that God is concerned in the everyday things of his creation, even a little sparrow falling from the air. Then there is the hair on our heads. Now, some of us have uh, more than others, and perhaps some of you, like me, well, the tide has receded and not come uh, back in. Now, on average, people have 100,000 hairs on their head. Redheads tend to have less, uh, around 90,000, and blondes, believe it or not, well, they have around 140,000. Now, here, in this passage of Scripture, Jesus says that God knows, God knows how many hairs there are on your head and mine. And that you, you and I are much more important to him than any sparrow. My friends, if God cares for each and every sparrow, then just think how much he cares for you and me. And yet, and yet... We do know this because he sent his son Jesus to tell us how much, how much God loves us. And then he showed us by Jesus dying on the cross for us. And that, my friends, that, my friends, is love indeed. However, however, we need to be reminded that for you and for me, this is the most important thing in our lives and the rest of the passage reminds us what this means in practical terms for firstly God knows better than us God knows better than us friends I have a wonderful son called Jacob he's a mechanic he's 21 and a few weeks ago uh, I asked him to help me uh, get uh, a petrol strimmer uh, going I have two it's just like I have two petrol lawnmowers at the moment. It's these things that you acquire uh, from parents' households, isn't it? Well, I asked him to get one of the strimmers going. And after a while, he uh, shrugged his shoulders and more or less said, It's broke. Now, call me old-fashioned, or just old. You see, I had another look. And perhaps I had some knowledge uh, that Jacob didn't have. Uh, but with a sniff uh, of the fuel, I realised it was old fuel. I poured it out put fresh fuel in, and, well, it started. 
it started. Now, just as a teacher knows better than a student, so God knows better than us what is best for us, what is good for us. And, and Jesus says, in addition, that God wants us, you and me, to grow more like him. For Jesus is not just a teacher, but he shows us by his very example how we are to live. Secondly, God wants us to put love of him first. God wants us to put our love of him first. Friends, God's love for us is so strong that he wants us to respond to him by loving him back more than we more than we love anyone else. Now that doesn't mean that we should love our parents, partners, children, etc, etc, any less, just that we should love God more. Let me say that again. This doesn't mean that we should love our parents, partners, children, etc, etc, any less, but that we should love God more. In fact, we are often able to show how much we love God by loving and caring for those around us. And Jesus, I believe again in his life and teaching, reminds us that when we do care for others, we are in fact caring for him. Well, thirdly, others know God through us. Thirdly, others know God through us. It may seem obvious, but when others respond to us and welcome our presence with them, they are welcoming Jesus. And through him, uh, uh, through us, well, they're welcoming uh, God. And that means, I guess, we, and we know this already, that if we say we are Christians, the followers of Jesus, then others will judge God by what they see in us and how, they, uh, how we treat them. If we're grumpy and fed up all the time, well, they'll think that God is grumpy and fed up all the time. Again, if we are rude and treat others badly or live lives that are corrupt, even sinful, well, that reflects on God. My friends, I cannot count the number of times I've said to prospective baptismal parents that they are God or rather the image of God to their children. For how they treat, how they live, will show what God is and means to them and reflect that image to their children. And it's the same for you and for me. For we are to be Christ-like, imitators of Christ, ambassadors, living witnesses. And therefore we are called to lives worthy of being called Christ ones. We are called to live lives worthy of being called Christ ones. Fourthly, well not everyone will like this. Yes my friends, being a follower of Jesus means that often we have to behave differently from others. We should be kind to the people that others are cruel to and perhaps tease and torment. We have to be really honest and not join in with the tricks and the scams of others. We have to stand up and even stand out as a follower of Jesus. Let me say that again. We have to at times stand up and stand out for God's love, for the principles and teachings of his son Jesus as we live lives as the followers as Christ's ones. Now to be truthful, and in my own experience, not everyone will like this. And as a result, as a result, well, they may well, well treat us badly. And for me, this, this is what Jesus means by not bringing peace. For it is not always easy to be true to God, to be a follower of Jesus, and to live as Christ's ones. The consequence being that sometimes we might have to be like Jeremiah and speak a word from God that is burning within us and that we know, that we know people won't want to hear. 
For Jeremiah's experience puts it in its place. It puts in its place the lie that says for those who follow God and speak his word, well, all will be well. All will be well. Well, no. For if we speak out for God's word, all may not be well. And for those today who still speak out bravely and challenge where their society, our society is going, they too, as in the prophets of old, may well pay a similar price for what they are saying and doing. But, but my friends, God calls his people. His kingdom people. No, he demands that we, you and I, as Christ ones, speak out for justice, for equality and fairness for all. All people, no matter what creed, gender, race, age, colour. For God cares for and knows the needs of all and calls his people to speak out to forth tell God's word. For as in Jeremiah's today, uh, day, so today, the powers that be may not like it, but they need to be challenged on so many issues, not least on the inequality, injustice and poverty that we see so evident even in our own land today. Let me say that again. For as in Jeremiah's day, so today, the powers that be may not like us as Christians as we challenge them on the issues that we see today, not least the inequality, the injustice and the poverty that we see so evident even in our own land. My friend, God calls you and me to action. And so to conclude, there's a reward. There is a reward. You see, my friends, God rewards all those who are true to him, who with his presence have a presence that is not just with us after we're dead, but a presence that is with us here and now. You see, too often Christianity is seen as only offering rewards in the next world. But, but in the experience of many, not least my own, there are rewards in the here and now for living God's way. For speaking out for him. Not earthly riches, as some may tell you, but the reward of knowing that God is working in through me and you, working in in and through you and me uh, making his kingdom come his will done and so we have that reward of that relationship with him in the here and now as he says to you and I as we stand up and as we speak out as the prophets of old have done well done good and faithful servant Friends, finally, uh, Matthew chapter 10 is indeed a series of hard sayings. But when you approach them from the starting point of the love of God, well then, then they do make sense. For I believe that God loves us and knows us better than we know ourselves. He wants us to put him first in our lives, to live our lives for him, and he calls us to stand up and to speak out not only words of love words of compassion but words of challenge words that speak to the inequalities of our world and of our land today so friends may we indeed hear the call of God upon our lives may we see his kingdom come and his will be done in and through us as we choose to live to Christ's praise and glory. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, friends.